How are you doing? Doing well. I told when you leave to our moderating this Then you can just say something for a day and then... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think you'll be able to hear me a little better if I take off my mask, but I'm not supposed to, uh, especially with the senior citizens around me. I too am a senior citizen. <laughs> uh, it's my honor, my privilege to welcome you to this Zoom gathering. It's called webinar. That's the new term. On the occasion of the launching of this book is called Aging and Poverty in India. And it's been written by the gentleman on my right, Mr. Matthew Cherian, who, as you know, has been more than two decades. He has more than two decades of experience of working with the elderly, and he has been, I mean, he was a civil engineer once upon a time, long, long time ago. But I'm going to introduce all of them in slightly greater detail. And we have a panel of speakers, an eminent panel of speakers, you know, some very, very knowledgeable individuals who are going to talk not just about this publication, which is just, I mean, it, it just come, it's, it's hot off the press, as they say. But we'll also have the occasion to hear what they have to say about the issues of aging and elderly citizens in this country. So congratulations, Matthew. Congratulations, Helpage. Thank you, Saxena Ji. Here we are. And, and I'm going to leave uh, Mr. Matthew Cherian and Dr. N.C. Saxena sitting here while I go to another location to moderate this discussion with them uh, on Zoom. Uh, I'll, I'll just briefly explain the format. We, we're going to ask each of the speakers to speak for maybe about five or seven minutes. And then thereafter, uh, have the panel discussion. There are some participants in the panel discussion who will be joining us a little later. So as and when they come, I shall introduce them. And uh, I suppose at the end, uh, we will have an occasion if, if there are some here who are in the audience who'd like to ask a few questions to either the panelists or the speakers, Matthew, Dr. Saxena, they would be most welcome. So congratulations once again, Matthew. We're not supposed to shake hands, are we? <laughs> okay. Well, can I shake your hand? Okay. <laughs> All the best. Thank you. And see you. A few words. Please, 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 please start, Dr. Saxena. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a great uh, pleasure and uh, privilege uh, to be here and to be talking about a very timely book. Now they can hear your voice. Can you hear me, Mr. Matthew? Yes, I can hear you, Mrs. Giri. Yeah. Okay, so, that's good. Thank you. Is my speaker do better? We have known each other for the last uh, 35 years now. 85, we worked together in the National Wasteland Development Board, where our job was to yes. fund NGOs. Yes. We did not take any, yes. any uh, uh, recommendation. We will just, on our own basis of subjective information, we will select and use and fund them. It was very bold, I think, at that time, because if there was an inquiry, we had no proof why we selected a particular NGO for funding. Well, this book is, as I said, very timely, and it's unfortunate that government has not given the kind of attention, the kind of support which the old people need. I was Secretary of Rural Development, and with great difficulty, 
I was able to start the scheme called the National Old Days Pension Program, where uh, only 75 rupees was being given per month to the uh, senior citizens of who were more than 65 years old, who were poor. And even among those who were in the BPL, only half were given at that point of time. The government thought that the other half are being looked after by their children. Gradually, government expanded and this condition uh, was removed and, and uh, everyone who was under BPL was being given. But even today, if you look at the overall number, it is just about 2.1 crore who are being given, where the number of those who are above 60 years of age, that is about, I think, 20 crore. So therefore, not all people, not all those who need uh, support are being given help by, by government. As uh, Secretary to Rural Development, I have sent a proposal to Planning Commission that I want to increase this amount and I want to really uh, help them. We have plenty of money. Planning Commission said nothing doing. This is a very <clears throat> not going to increase productivity and this is consumption oriented, so therefore we will not help, uh, help increase the, the uh, money. It so happened that I went to Planning Commission soon after that as became Secretary. Then I sent a letter to Secretary Rural Development that I am very keen. Planning Commission is very keen to increase funding for this program and please send a proposal. Secretary Rural Development not only did not send a proposal, he downgraded his scheme from what is called CSS to ACA, centrally sponsored program scheme to ACA, which means that only state governments can increase. So therefore, what I'm saying is that there is this administrative culture and political culture which has not been very favorable to those uh, who are uh, old and they are not getting uh, full benefit. Although uh, I believe I read on the, in the uh, Lok Sabha uh, debates that government has appointed a committee to examine uh, whether money should be increased. So let's hope it, it increases. Well, if you see in the last 25 years, uh, from 95 to 2020, in those 25 years, pensions, the government has contribution has increased only from 75 to 200, not even three times. But the pension of IS officers has increased by 30 times from 4,000 to 120,000. So that's the, that's the, you know, uh, you can see who is being uh, helped by government and who's not getting help. And the prices have gone up by 10 times. So not that government has, has certainly helped in other programs. If you compare old age pension with, say, uh, Awas Yojana, in Awas Yojana, the amount has increased from 25,000 to 150,000, six times. But pensions have not increased, so it's very unfortunate. And it's so <coughs> that this group would be able to uh, provide a forum for civil society to act, and it would be there should be uh, greater advocacy on this issue. And let's hope that the committee which has been set up, I do not know whether Health Page is involved in that committee or not, but that committee recommends, and the government of India uh, listens to the committee and increases the uh, pension. A similar problem is of old day or, or, or widows, which has been covered by Matthew very ably in his book. There again, as he has suggested, uh, widows uh, do not, in general, the, the, the rules and the laws are such that when a landowner dies, his wife does not inherit that land. So therefore, that again uh, was changed by me when I was in the National Advisory Council and we changed the Hindu Succession Act. But even that change has not been fully implemented by many states. And therefore, women are still not getting the kind of share in assets which they need to have. So therefore, we also need to be greater advocacy by civil society, by research organizations on this hope, on these issues. And I'm sure uh, uh, that is the book will really be a step forward in that direction. So I once again like to congratulate Matthew uh, for his uh, very interesting, very readable and very timely book. And I hope that this would have the real impact. Well, thank you so much, Dr. <laughs> Chandra Saxena. Unlike the other speakers, I, I'm introducing him after he has uh, made his initial presentation. So uh, just for the information of uh, everybody, and I'm sure he really needs no introduction, Dr. Saxena topped his batch in the Indian uh, Administrative Service, which was in way back in 1964. And he retired as Secretary of the 
introduction of the then uh, planning commission. He's worked in various uh, ministries. He was secretary, rural development, minorities commission, member of the National Advisory Council. And, and he's also headed the, uh, he was director of the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration in, in, in Mussoorie. He's, he's trained senior civil servants. And on behalf of the Supreme Court of India, he's monitored uh, several uh, hunger-based programs. And, and he's been on various committees. And he holds a doctorate in forestry from the Oxford University. Once again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saxena, for giving us, uh, for giving Matthew uh, this wonderful endorsement. And then I'm now going to ask the author himself, uh, Mr. Matthew Cherian, to speak. And, and I'll introduce him in a few sentences. He is a civil engineer from the Billa Institute of Technology and Science in, uh, in, in Pilani. And he's also a rural manager from the uh, uh, Institute of Rural Management in, uh, in, in, in Anand, in Gujarat. And he's worked for about uh, four decades in, in, in various, in the development sector, if you like, including almost two decades, 17 years to be precise, in the area of aging. He's also worked in cooperatives, wasteland development, relief operations, fair trade. And, and he founded the Charities Aid Foundation in India. And, and he's been the CEO of Helpage for the last 17 years. He's going to be retiring very soon. Uh, he's been, uh, he has been appointed. Uh, he was served on the board of Helpage International. He's appointed, he's been appointed as the, uh, as a global ambassador for aging. And he's also been, been mem a member of the Global Future Council of the World Economic Forum on Aging and Longevity. Uh, Matthew Terrian has also served as a, a friend of the Supreme Court and I'm in the elder rights matters for pensions, homes, and the maintenance law, which has helped many, many senior citizens and their rights to the forefront. Uh, and, and he's a recipient of a number of awards, including a li lifetime award for ASLI for senior living in 2019. And his first book, and I have the honor to publish it uh, like this one, it was on uh, the nonprofit sector, it was published in 2016. It's called A Million Missions. And, and, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Matthew, for writing this book. And, and as everybody knows, uh, India is supposed to be a very, very young country. Out of 1.35 billion people, about half of its population is below the age of 26 or 27. The median age is perhaps somewhere between 27 and 28. So there is a lot of talk uh, about the demographic dividend of India. But in the process, uh, public attention is often uh, not, uh, I mean, uh, public attention is, uh, there's not adequate public attention on the problems of senior citizens and the elderly. Matthew, over to you. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you've written and, and why you've written what you have. And, and please share whatever you wish to, to all those present on this occasion. Thank you, Paranjoy, and thank you, Dr. N.C. Saxena, for those kind words. And Dr. N.C. Saxena has been a mentor throughout my life for what, and he is the, I call the guru on poverty research in this country. Once again, I'd like to say that this book was primarily written. I was directed by my partner, Amita Joseph, to better write things during the COVID and don't waste your time during COVID and write something about what is. So actually what I've written is entirely about uh, HelpAge India and its work and what we advocate. And of course, it's been a family effort. My elder daughter, Aprajita, edited for long stretches of time the book. And uh, my younger daughter designed the cover, which you can see. And so it's been a family effort of kind. So coming to uh, today, this day, uh, we are having to have World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. And uh, this, this day is completely an anomaly because this is a country which prided on looking after its elderly. And we have come to such a pass that it is become, we have to talk about elder abuse and awareness. Uh, Vishnu, can I? 
screen seems to be locked. So the whole book is written about age discrimination. And actually we have been discriminating because of age across the country. I go across and we see Mrs. Moinigiri who worked with the widows of Vrindavan. We are discriminating against widows. And as soon as the husband passes away, we try to send her to Vrindavan or to Varanasi or places like that. We discriminate due to the poor, to the economic status. Those who are poor are discriminated in this country. And is neglect and poverty of senior citizens acceptable? Or they have all contributed to this country's GDP. Can we neglect them? Is abuse and killing of older people acceptable or leaving them to die due to COVID-19 and to disasters? I've also dealt in this book about Talai Kutal, the practice of killing adults in southern Tamil Nadu, which I think is a blot on our nation. And we hope that on this day of elder abuse, we are reminded that not only we neglect them and allow them to die, we also ne neglect them to such a stage that we also kill them in the process. So currently, it's 140 million elderly in 2020. 30 million of them are estimated to be living alone. 90 million have to keep working till they die for their livelihood. And about 12 million are blind. And according to the Sumit Bose committee on the SECC census, he said 53 million elderly are below the poverty line. And by 2050, India would no longer be a young nation. We'll become an old nation where one in four persons will be old. And the current crisis of COVID-19 has exposed the crisis facing older people. It has pushed another 30 million older people to the at risk, to the brink, and they are facing starvation in many places. And there is going to be a rural health crisis where more and more elderly are likely to die because rural areas have poor or no geriatric care. And uh, my colleague and fellow traveler, Dr. Day, will talk about the lack of geriatric care in rural areas. This is a curve which is many countries, European countries, moved from 7% of their population to 14% of their population in more than 100 years or 120 years. Whereas China reached the 14% mark in 20 years, and India is also going to reach in another 20 years by 2040, 14% of the population will be old. And then we would no longer be the young nation that we pride about, we would be an old nation. And more, more and more people are living longer and most people now live to be 80 years and we have got a 20 plus years of longevity. But these 20 plus years will depend on the health status of the elderly. And we also have this problem that the pension that Dr. N.C. Saxena talked about, which was 200 rupees, has now deflated to only value of 92 rupees per month. This is completely against the dignity of older persons, and it is a shame that this country offers this amount as elderly. And uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Nikhil Day, and has been fighting on pensions through the pension parishad. And we have been demanding a minimum pension of 3,000 rupees a month, which should be revised once in three years, so that it should also be indexed for inflation. Dr. N.C. Saxena, in the forward to the book, said that bureaucrats and various officers receive salary uh, increases of pension to such a great amount. Whereas today we have less and less people who are uh, having even just 200 rupees to survive their complete year. So we need it to be in adjusted to inflation. And when it comes to the second, second point of health and aging, which I've dealt in a chapter, we have lack of a, any clear policy on health and aging. We have no social security for 90 million older persons and no health insurance of any kind for old people. 
In 2010, we launched the national program for healthcare of the elderly to provide one geriatric ward in every district. Today, we have 717 districts, and it has reached only 196 districts in eight years. There has been no political will to expand this healthcare, and the COVID crisis will strike at the roots of rural India because of this crisis. There are no geriatric beds in many rural districts in the country. And uh, the COVID crisis has shown that no geriatric beds and about 520 districts in this country have no geriatric beds. COVID will go to kill people in the 70s, 80s and 90s in the poorest areas of the country. Can we allow it to happen? And I have raised in this book the lack of health care in many parts and we like to also thank the team of HelpAge India, which has been providing health care through our mobile medical units in more than 125 districts across the country. And this has been a great thing. And I'd like to acknowledge the work of team HelpAge in this area. When, when it, it comes, comes to older, older women, they end up as having no rights. End up as I'm sorry, there's some technical problem here. Can you hear me now? Rajaram Mohan Roy, 162 years ago, started campaigning for widow remarriage. We still continue to discriminate poor widows across the country. And if you go to these locations, especially the religious places of Vrindavan, Varanasi, you will find that they are in. So I've tried to highlight this, and this was also taken up in uh, public interest litigation where Justice Madan Lokur and Justice Deepak Gupta passed in their judgment to bring about rights for the widows and pension for the widows. And Justice Madan Lokur wrote in his judgment, millions of persons belonging to deprived and vulnerable sections of humanity are looking to the courts for improving their life conditions and miss, making basic human rights meaningful for them. They have been crying for justice, but their cries have so far been in the wilderness. They have been suffering injustice silently with the patience of a rock, without the strength even to shed tears. So that is the state of the widows in this country. When it comes to discrimination and elder abuse, today is a awareness on Elder Abuse Day. Old persons have become soft targets for criminal elements and victims of fraudulent dealings. One in three older persons in India have faced abuse at some point of time. Abuser has mostly been the son followed by the daughter-in-law. They always say it is a Sas Bahu and a Beta trilogy, but actually the Beta is the main, uh, main person who 
perpetuates elder abuse. And I also wrote in the book about Talai Kutal in Tamil Nadu, which was discovered by our team in Tamil Nadu, where in the district of Virudunagar, they kill older adults when they grow very old. And this practice is an abhorrent practice and has to be stopped right away. And on the occasion of elder abuse, I call upon people to look at so that you do not kill people. And even if you allow people to die due to COVID, that is also another form of elder abuse. And uh, down south in Kerala, our team worked to create age-friendly Kerala. Mr. Vijay Anand, who was the chief secretary of Kerala state, initiated the age-friendly Kerala movement across Kerala. And we find that most of the small cities and communities in in Kerala have become age friendly. And it has also involved Kudumbashri and the elder self-help groups across the country. No wonder in this COVID crisis, Kerala scored better than- Yeah, you can many speak. Yeah, yeah now you state. can speak and they will hear you. And help age, in its own way, started a demonstration of elder self-help groups, which has expanded to 50,000 elderly across the country. And uh, my friend and colleague, Rajeshwar Devarkonda, was one of the pioneers in trying this method out. And it was able to spread across, not only from Tamil Nadu to Bihar, to other no, states. I can't see them. And so this has created a new the movement host? for livelihood. And I suggested, I have suggested in the book that there should be a separate livelihoods mission for senior citizens within the Ministry of Social Justice so that they can become self-sufficient with uh, dropping remittances from children. So this is something which we need to do. And I've dealt a lot with our uh, experience in disasters and pandemics. And be it the Kerala floods or tsunami or the Uttarakhand Himalayan tragedy, elders have always been the last and lost in all disasters and even now in the pandemic. We are neglecting elderly and today they are living across the country without <laughs> rations of pension. Huh? Yeah, pension is now looming in many rural districts and almost 87 million need pensions and rations. The COVID-19 health risk is very real. There are still no clear numbers on the spread to the elderly. So we hope that with this book, I will be able to highlight the risks that older people are facing. And uh, so the way forward suggested is universal pension is a right for elders. I have suggested seven steps, which is universal pension. Health security is a right. Okay. We have to expand health care to all 717 districts. Pension for all widows, irrespective of age, and implement the Supreme Court judgment. Create a separate livelihoods mission for elderly, and ultimately create an age-friendly society. There is also the national policy for senior citizens, which the Mohini Giri Committee had recommended, which is still lying in the files of the ministry, with no, the government should straight away approve the national policy for senior citizens so that this country has a better policy for senior citizens. And on this day, I would say neglecting elders is tantamount to elder abuse by the state. We demand justice and dignity for the old in India. If we do not implement it, this will not be a country for senior citizens. India will no longer remain to be a country. And I would like to thank Kiran Karnik, Chairman, Rohit Prasad, Anupamar, Rajeshwar, and Team Helpage for the work that we have done across the country. <coughs> and without Team Helpage, this book would not have been a reality. So thank you all. So this is the contents of the book in a small presentation which of course uh, we hope that the panelists will also throw light on the subject as we go along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew.
for your opening remarks. And, you know, we brought out this book uh, rather quickly. We had uh, didn't have too much time in bringing it out. Uh, so if there are some proof errors, please excuse us. Uh, in, in future editions, we'll correct them, bring it to our notice. Uh, so we had to bring out the book in a bit of a rush. So, okay, thank you so much once again, Matthew, for uh, introducing the book and in that PowerPoint presentation, telling us a little about what the book contains. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have some of the panelists who will be joining us at a later point of time. Uh, let me for now request uh, Ms. V. Mohini Giri to speak. And uh, I'd, I'd request the uh, administrator of this discussion to unmute her. Uh, she was uh, unmuted at the wrong time, but now uh, she should be unmuted. And, and to introduce her briefly, she's an, uh, a community service worker and an activist who has been uh, the person of the Guild of Service, which is a Delhi-based social organization that was established in 1979 and, and provides uh, uh, is, is an advocacy organization for women's rights, children's rights, for their education, for their employment, for their financial security. And she, she's the founder of the War Widows Association in 1972. And she uh, was the, the, the chairperson of the National Commission for Women between 1995 and 1998. And she's the recipient i mean she was awarded the padma bhushan and 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 of course uh, the daughter in law of the former president of india vp giri so uh, um, ms mohini giri uh, the floor is yours uh, please speak uh, on the issue and the book uh, and i'll request you once again to uh, to confine your comments with 5 to 7 minutes over to you ma'am thank you so much for giving me this opportunity at the very outset, I would like to congratulate Matthew Cherian for having done a tremendous job. He has not only brought out all the things that we need, but he has also specified with great recommendations, which I appreciate very much. And uh, I would like, since it's a World Elderly Day, I would concentrate perhaps only on widows and talk about the widows, which is my constituency, and the elderly, elderly widows. Uh, there have been many, many, many uh, times since perhaps from my childhood till today that in these uh, 70, 80 years, we have been talking about the elderly, we have been talking about the widows and not having achieved anything for the elderly widows. It's a shame on our country that we are today, after all the efforts and so many governments, we have not been able to do anything for this constituency. Of course, in the recent past, the Supreme Court has taken up two or three points and they have uh, recommended many things, but that's not sufficient. Matthew, my congratulations to you for having done such a good job. Uh, shall I reserve my comments for later on or shall I start them uh, just now? Yes, now? Madam, uh, Madam uh, I would like... Uh, yes? If I may just inter uh, uh, intervene briefly, Madam. Feel free to make a few comments, and, and later on, you can expand on some of them. I have, yeah, another, my, request. Okay. I have another request for you. Hello, ma'am. Yeah, Could I will you... confine my comments to geriatric care, which Matthew oh. has pointed out so brilliantly. Ma'am, ma'am, I'm intervening briefly. If you can have the frame of your, if you can have the camera in the middle, we are only getting sort of half your face. So if you can adjust your the picture um, so that we see your, your, your face. We only see one. Of, uh, that's a little better. That's a little better. Can you see my picture now? Uh, yes, yes. Except I'm seeing only part of your thing. If you can just adjust, <laughs> adjust either said, where you are sitting. Well, as, long as, you hear my, as long as you hear my voice, that should be all right. Yeah, we, we are hearing you loud and clear, please. Please continue, yes. ma'am. And, and yeah, I was saying that in these 80 years of my life or 83 years of my life, we have been talking about the elderly care since time immemorial now. And what have we done really? And Matthew has brought that out very well. And I really hope that all the recommendations that he has made would be perhaps put into action. I'll especially point out to the geriatric care, which is really the most essential thing of today. Because unless we have this, I must congratulate Dr. Day, who's sitting there, uh, for having done a lot of work on that and having made a tremendous impact on people, especially the poor people and the widows, 
And this has to be replicated in all the districts of India at once. Uh, perhaps Matthew has touched a little bit on loneliness. Loneliness is a very important part of growing old and aging, especially when it's a single woman and an elderly widow. That's a very important thing which we need to take care of. He has spoken about urban poverty and rural poverty. There is a difference, a lot of difference between rural poverty and urban poverty. And I will at this pace, uh, at this time, perhaps stop it here and talk about the rest of the things, the vulnerability and who is a BPL family and what are we doing for them? Then what is the state policy and why is the national policy not being implemented at all? And why even after so many years, it's a central and state subject and not only controlled by one. This is happening with other things also, uh, for with our soldiers, with our other people who are getting pensions. So we need to take care of this very, very much. I would leave it here to come back with my comments after hearing the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, Pranan Joy, Pranan Joy, this is Ashwani Kumar here. I just, <laughs> tell, uh, just, Kumar? just tell, just tell Matthews I'm, I'm around. I know uh, we can see uh, you, sir. We I can. Want, see I answer there. to his summons. I will make a five-minute or three-minute interjection before I leave. So whenever you have the time, please let me know. Okay. So I, I have a choice between asking either Mr. Nikhil Day to speak before you uh, uh, and you after that, if you can uh, uh, give yes, us a little bit. That's fine. Let Nikhil speak first. All right. Uh, Nik Nikhil, are you here? Can you hear us, Nikhil? We can't see you yet. Thank you much there, and oh. I'm also unmuted now. Okay, Nikhil, please. Yeah, so it's yours. Uh, we start with you, and then after, if you after you speak for about five minutes, uh, we are going to ask uh, 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 Mr. Ashwini Kumar to speak. Yes, please, Nikhil. Uh, so it's great that Dr. Uh, Ashwini Kumar. Again, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Nikhil. Oh my God, I need to introduce you. You're not yet a senior citizen. You, uh, unlike most of us, you're a young lad of only 47. I no, mean, no, I'm are... not at all. I'm 57. So oh that... <laughs> my God, that's a typographical error. You're still not a senior citizen. As they would say in Bangla, your mother tongue, you're a Koti Koka. Oh, no problem. Nikhil, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the founder members of the MKSS, which is the Mazdoor Kisan Sh Shakti Sangatan. And together with Aruna Roy and, and Shankar Singh, he's been part of uh, the organization and its numerous struggles for the poor, uh, as far as their land is concerned, payment of minimum wages, issues of justice, equality, and of course, he's been very, very active in the whole pension parishad movement and, and, and besides, of course, the right to information and the right to work. Please, please, Nikhil. Please, yeah. it's yours now. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Paranjay. Thanks so much uh, as well, Hill Page, Matthew, and to also, also acknowledge all the other panelists who are great, including Dr. Ashwini Kumar, who will follow, because Hill Page and Dr. Ashwini Kumar, through his uh, repetition, have played an extremely important role in have played an extremely important role in highlighting the issue, the pathetic condition actually of elderly. And I think the great thing about this book is that it is about both problems, the issue of aging and its big crisis during Corona times, and the issue of poverty, the combination of both. And on both sides, there are prejudices. This is unfortunately a time of prejudices in this country. There are prejudices at multiple levels. But here, both age, there is a prejudice against the elderly, and there's an unseeing of the elderly, and there is an unseeing of class, the poverty-stricken people. Uh, in this book, it is great that these issues are looked at, and Dr. N.C. Saxena talked about when he was both in the NAC and in the Planning Commission, and at various points, people like him have made recommendations, but unfortunately, this, as far as the central government is concerned, it is really not just a cruel joke, as it was called even by the minister at that time, um, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, when he talked about the quantum of pensions. 
to have a 200 rupee pension at that time was a cruel joke today i don't know what one can call it and one must remember that it is now a centrally sponsored scheme and it is a scheme in which the central government says even the guidelines say that we hope the states will do an equal amount now if we say there are three or four or five statistics that are pointed out in chapter 2 and that's what i'll concentrate on very quickly which is universal coverage firstly we'll talk about a little bit about universal coverage and the quantum of that coverage so to have 90 million people 98 million 90 to 98 million people in the 2011 census who were elderly of course we have frozen all our things with the 2011 census so whether it is national food security act or whether it is pensions or whether it is any other benefit we have not moved along as we've gone along and as a result today if we have 120 million people we have not expanded that coverage beyond that and we still have that same 19 to 22% of the elderly who are being covered even by that pathetic pension as it exists uh matthew talked about 53 million of the elderly living below the poverty line and another 13 million for perhaps having gone below the poverty line today as he said we don't even know how much covid has affected the elderly we know across the world that they are the most affected the most vulnerable and actually if you go out whether it's in urban areas or in rural areas the elderly are very very difficult to be able to even find and to be able to look at what kind of caregiving needs to be given to them we are today spending 200 rupees which in today's prices are not even 92 it's even come down further because with each passing day it comes down the quantum of money and what it is means and if we are saying world day against abuse of the elderly they have no other support even in the economic pass package that was given by the government whether in the 1.1 lakh 76000 crores or in the 20 lakh crore package a uh, so called 20 lakh crore package for the elderly there was nothing except some words of sympathy nothing else given at all so you cannot have a situation where you are only saying that we hope everyone will look after the elderly when you are not giving anything to the elderly to look after themselves uh i think the most important thing about this release of this book is it's given some kind of platform through this platform i think what we need to make an appeal about is that immediately there needs to be a special package for the elderly particularly the elderly poor they are as matthew says going to die they are not only going to die of covid they are going to die of poverty they are going to die of hunger they are going to die of starvation and the least that they could have been given is at least from the millions of tons of food grain you would have said that all the elderly will get enough food grain for this period even that has not been given that could have been a special package because that's money that's available if we look across the world as again in that chapter that that uh, in this book that matthew has pointed out that there are countries which now have about 5% of gdp spent on the elderly there are countries that spend 20 to 25% on the social security and our entire social security amount of gdp is 1.5% how possibly will we be able to look after all those who are vulnerable we saw pictures let's remember that even while people were walking back of workers we saw elderly being carried on the workers backs we saw elderly walking we saw the elderly struggling and now we are not even going to see the elderly dying because they are all all in their homes and nobody is even going to notice them this report is at least bringing it out this book is bringing it out i think each one of the speakers and i'm so glad that this issue is being focused on but my appeal is all of us who have a voice we need to make find a way to give a voice and put across two or three things that for this period there must be a package where they get a kind of cash transfer which is equal to half of minimum wage that they must get free, free food grain as a special package all the elderly must get access to feed free food grain at least 10 kilos including dal so that they don't die of hunger and starvation and i think one of the greatest things that we have seen for the elderly the elderly poor in particular has been this coming together of help age and pension parishad because pension parishad has tried to do some form of mobilization and help age has come together with its huge outreach to try and make sure the voice of the elderly poor comes 
I want to acknowledge to the entire Helpage community, to Matthew, to everyone else. And even now, this platform is being used in that way. So I think this platform should pass some resolutions and the resolutions must be to save the elderly from dying if we really care about them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nikhil, for those remarks. You have been, as always, impassioned and articulate in, in, in stating your point, I mean, in expressing yourself. I, I think there are two points you made which are very, very important. I mean, look, the point is the Food Corporation of India has three times the amount of food grain in its go down than what is considered to be a quote unquote safe buffer stock for the country. And therefore, it defies logic as to why this food grain should not be distributed free to those who need them the most, and that includes the elderly. So I, I think that's a very, very important point that you've made. And, and, and I would urge everybody here on the panel and Matthew and everybody else, that if, if we can disseminate this book, if we can have it translated into different languages, including Hindi, uh, and, and that would be in, in fact a good way to, to contribute to this effort. So uh, the next speaker here is uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar. Now he really needs no introduction. He really needs no introduction. He's been a, a lawyer, a, a politician, associate. He's a politician of the Indian National Congress. Uh, a former. Uh, he was a mem he is a member of Parliament in the Rajya Sabha, representing the state of Punjab. He served as Union Minister of Law and Justice, and he's also been a Minister of State in the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, and also the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And in 1991, in fact, he, at the age of 37, he was one of the youngest. He was appointed as one of the youngest additional Solicitor Generals of India, and and he's been the a spokesperson of the the Indian National Congress, the chairman of the Sikhar Vibhag. And then, of course, he's uh, argued many, many important cases. He's, he's written a number of books, including uh, uh, the, the, a case on the Bhopal gas tragedy. Uh, and he, uh, he, he's, of course, uh, uh, he, he's been a member of the Rajya Sabha since 2002. So I, I hope uh, I haven't uh, miss, missed out on any important points. Uh, Ashwini ji, uh, the floor is yours. Paranja, can I say one thing that he's done? You know, he's been the petitioner in person for one of the most important cases on the elderly, which is still going on in the Supreme Court. And that really was one of the only things in the last few years that has raised it on a public policy platform and brought the government at least into that discussion. Thank you. Thank you uh, for uh, adding that point, Nikhil. Uh, thank you, Paranjoy. Uh, thank yes. you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and uh, talking to all of you. I haven't spoken to Pranan Joy in a while. Uh, I'm delighted that Nikhil is here, Matthew Chain is here, Mohini Giriji is here, Mr. Sixena is here. All these stalwarts uh, who have immensely contributed in a very noble cause, namely bringing succor and dignity to the elderly. I would, in two minutes that I have to speak, uh, talk about what dignity means to all of us and what it means especially to the elderly. Uh, in, my, in an old age home that I was able to facilitate uh, in my constituency in Gurdaspur through the use of my MP lad funds, every time I go there, I have tears in my eyes, not because the elderly are not being fed, not because the elderly are not being taken care of to the best of the ability of the help age who's doing an excellent job there, but because I still see in their eyes, loneliness, humiliation, neglect, and all kinds of emotional traumas that at that age we are naturally susceptible to. I just cannot imagine that people at a particular age who have been as the photograph on the book of Matthew Charon shows the, sh the providers of shade to all their children and all those dependent on them are left to fend for themselves in the winter of their lives. I don't think there could be a greater crime against humanity uh, than the neglect of the elderly. It 
militates against our culture. It militates against all that is noble, against all that we were taught and against all that India has stood for. Compassion, respect and dignity for the elderly. It was the sight of neglect of the elderly that moved me to take certain initiatives for a cause that all of us hold dear. I'm satisfied that I was able to move the Supreme Court and was able to at least get an approval on principle for all that we had stated. I have now moved two intervention and interim applications before the Supreme Court in the same case uh, in which there is a continuing mandamus by the court to the government to put into place effective mechanisms for the dignity and well-being of the elderly. Uh, I'm expecting those IEAs to come up any day now, in which case, of course, Matthew and Nikhil will be informed and hopefully they will be able to join in the web hearings to supplement the hearings. I believe that the most important aspect of the lives of the elderly who are suffering neglect is the need to compensate them for the lost dignity. I feel extremely strongly about this. One can even do without food for a day, but one can't do with a sense of self-esteem even for a minute. We may be forced to live without a sense of self-esteem. That's another matter. But loss of dignity is a wound in the soul that festers forever and ever. And the elderly who are helpless, completely vulnerable in the face of gross injustice of their own, cannot even give vent to their expressions. So one of the factors that I would recommend, of course, is more and more people visiting such people, particularly those who are living in the old age homes and giving them emotional support. I entirely agree with every single premise that is the foundation of Matthew Cherian's well-researched book. And I would like to commend him for this extremely noble initiative that he has taken. And I would certainly agree with Nikhil that at the end of the day, it is important to put into the pockets of the elderly enough subsistence money that can ensure for them a life of dignity. Government processes are always flawed with various inadequacies that sometimes defeat the very intent for which those processes are designed. As the planning minister, I was aware of the food distribution schemes, uh, which was being monitored by the Supreme Court. And a formal judge of the Supreme Court, a very distinguished uh, jurist, who was in charge of monitoring the delivery mechanisms for that scheme, also was helpless uh, in, 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 in many ways. So what I would like to see is that there is a single nodal platform at the level of the central and state governments in each state where well-established NGOs active and dedicated in the field are formally and happily co-opted to ensure an effective implementation of all the schemes that the government runs for the welfare of the elderly. Now, when we were uh, arguing this petition, Nikhil and Matthew gave me statistics to show how little we spend on pensions, less than 0.04% uh, of our GDP, how little we spend on medical care. The pandemic has demonstrated beyond doubt that our allocations for public health are not only dismal, they are pathetic and they are tragic. Even now, if governments don't wake up to the reality of an exponential increase in the spending on public health, medical care, 
and the welfare of the now 16 crore elderly, India would be an impoverished nation despite boasts of its 2.3 trillion GDP. I think a time has come when our frame of reference for the development of countries actually moves away from mere GDP numbers to the gross national happiness uh, indexes. It is possible for us to correlate the two. Otherwise, numbers don't mean a thing. A $2.2 trillion economy being heavily controlled by a group of individuals or corporations in India mean nothing to the vast masses of the people who constitute the soul of our country. So I would hasten to add in conclusion that people like Matthew and Saxena Saab and, 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 and Nikhil and others uh, enjoy, should focus on concrete, specific, doable initiatives which we could bring to the notice of the Supreme Court on the three or four uh, issues that we have raised for the court to uh, stamp those with its imprimatur so that the government has no choice in the matter. I have been a part of the government and I would not like to say that governments are not keen to ameliorate the sufferings of the people. It just so happens that in the, in the clog of governance, this is a very small part of the agenda of governance, whereas it should be a major focus uh, in, the, in the governance agenda. I think to get that mindset to become a reality, we will need active political mobilization of the people to enlist the voice of the voiceless, as it, as it is said, in aid of a program which by all accounts I treat as a program truly of national renewal by investing our elderly with dignity, by ensuring that their means of subsistence permit them to live a life of dignity and a modicum of happiness, we would have done a human service to not only our heritage, but as legatees of a great nation to the future of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashwini ji, for your comments and your suggestions and your observations. And I'm hopeful that all the people over here would uh, not just uh, who have listened to you attentively would try and actually operationalize important points and the suggestions that you've made. I'm happy to welcome at this juncture, Mr. Kiran Karnik, and he's the chairperson of Helpage India. He was actually supposed to start our discussion, but since he's coming a little late, uh, I hope, uh, Mr. Karnik, you will not mind waiting a little bit because we have two speakers from the United States of America who have been also waiting for a while, and I'd request them to speak. Is that okay with you, Mr. Kiran Karnik? Thank you, Paranjoy. Absolutely. First, my sincere apologies. I had a crashing engagement, which was long standing, and I told Matthew that I want to join this, and it would look bad if I come in at five instead of coming in at four. He said, no, no, come when you can. So my apologies oh. to all of you first. Oh, and I'm sure. happy to join Paranjoy when, whenever you, you please go all ahead. All right. So I'm, I'm going to get back Thank to you. you. But uh, before that, I'm going to now request uh, the administrator of this, uh, this uh, webinar to unmute Dr. Muthuswami Kumaran. He, he's joining us uh, uh, from, the, from Florida in the United States of America. He's associated professor there. Uh, he, he's, he's, a, he's a teacher, he's a researcher, and, and, and he, he's a, a consultant and, and worked with a number of uh, nonprofit organizations and, and non-government organizations. And, and, and he's, uh, uh, his areas of research interest, and it's, it's not just a management of a nonprofit organizations and 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 uh, and, and, and uh, NGOs, but also looking at the roles and the impacts uh, uh, of, of issues relating to communities, uh, home and community-based senior citizens, 
services, and, and he's worked in building the capacity of such NGOs in different parts of not just India, but in Nepal, South Korea, and the Bahamas. And he's delivered talks uh, in various places, including uh, in Japan and, and South Korea. And before he uh, became an academic, he was also working with the state government. And he's currently serving on the boards of three not-for-profit not, not organizations based in Florida. So over to you now, uh, Dr. Mukhuswami Kumaran. Uh, please start. Namaskar, Namaskar. Greetings, folks. Greetings from the other side of Mother Earth uh, from Florida. Thank you for the introduction. I too would like to congratulate Matthew for another uh, excellent book. This is his second book, as uh, the moderator mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, in his outline, in his presentation, he clearly outlined the depth of research that went behind uh, in writing this book. And I'm an academic, I'm a researcher, I teach nonprofit management. I know what it takes to put together a book of this magnitude. Uh, I'm a big fan of his first book, A Million Missions. In fact, I, my students use it as a textbook. It's a required textbook in my course. Uh, and also it's been a joy for me to know Matthew in the last 10 years, uh, not only as a practitioner, a practitioner in the NGO world, but also the leader of, uh, of the NGO sector in, the, in, in, in India. Uh, uh, you know, all of you know much better than me uh, the, the serious issues that elderly face in, in, in India. Uh, when I hear the statistics and when he highlighted the statistics, it, it really saddens me to know the cruel, you know, a joke of 200 rupees, that's less than $3, uh, a pension and so on, so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, as other speakers highlighted uh, from different angles, the policy frameworks and so on and so forth, the in-ground reality. Uh, but I come to India once in a year, I visit, uh, I visit uh, HelpAge India. I've come with, uh, last year I was there with 26 students. We visited HelpAge both at the head headquarters level and also at the Thamarik Plum level. So we, uh, I observe how HelpAge has kind of uh, uh, is the, in the front line of this movement, if you will. But Matthew clearly, you know, mentioned uh, made a call to action for uh, for everybody around around the country, the politicians and you know the NGO sector, the private sector, the people, and so on, so on, so forth. It's very high. It's high time that uh, his strong research based book taken seriously across the sector. Uh, I, I work a lot with uh, nonprofits that are in the US aging network. So I'd like to give some framework on how it is done in the US. It's not perfect, but it's much, much better than several countries. Uh, in the US context, Matthew, is, first of all, the, is the title of the book is Poverty, uh, Aging and Poverty. Now, so uh, in the US, way back in 1935, and then revived in 1965, the Social Security Act address the issue of pension. So that is a completely separate major issue that needs to be addressed immediately. These 200 rupees, you know, it really bothers me to know the pension level. And still I see, almost every day I see news. I, 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 read, I read news from India every day. Uh, that corporate thugs are walking away with thousands and thousands of crores of rupees and so on and so forth. But without getting into that, let me quickly uh, highlight the framework of how it works in the US. So the social security system that is very strong in this country takes considerable, uh, to a considerable extent, it takes care of the pension, the livelihood, the income issue. Yes, there are income disparities among elderly, there are discrimination, there is uh, uh, abuse and so on and so forth, but to a considerable extent, it is addressed by the social security system, the pension system. More importantly, in terms of community, home and community-based healthcare, in 1965, way back in 1965, US passed the Older American Act, a landmark act that is a model for, for the world, basically. So as a result of that, the federal government initiated the administration on aging. So Matthew was mentioning earlier, still there is a policy framework which is well drafted. I know Matthew was part of, part of that and many of you folks are uh, contributed to that strong policy framework which is still collecting dust. 
Way back in 1965, U.S. established an administration on aging at the federal level, very powerful agency. And more importantly, at every state level, an area aging network was formed. So interestingly, these area agencies on net, area agencies on aging are in the nonprofit world, NGOs. Most of them are NGOs. Some of them are county operated and so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is in the US, the reason for which the Older American Act is so successful is because of this institutional structure. At the federal level, there's an administration on aging. Every state level, there is an elderly affair, ministry level elderly affair. And then at the state level, in the, at the, at the in-ground level, every county has an area agency on aging. I work with these organizations, nonprofit organizations, to improve the capacity. Now, when it comes to India, I've, uh, I've visited hundreds of NGOs. That's my, I teach, I do research, I train NGO leaders in more than 3,000 NGO leaders in nine countries. Uh, I've seen amazing NGOs at the, at, the, at the ground level, at the village level. You know, uh, yes, HelpAge is doing an amazing job at the headquarter level on a national scale, but also at the Tamarai Kulam level, where the rubber hits the road, where the people are suffering and so on and so forth. Several other examples, Sevalaya in, 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 in Chennai and so on and so forth. From, from my perspective, it's high time that there's a movement. You know, clearly this is a call to action. You know, I hope this, is, uh, this reverberates across the statistics that Matthew put together. Uh, is going to you know, bring all of us together and try to have this institutional framework you know, push the government uh, for this kind of a structure. So when there is a formal structure, both the NGOs and governments and civil servants together, it, that, that, that becomes a, 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 that gives a structural form for the issues to be taken at all the level and understand at the law level, not to mention the, uh, the, the resources they need for home and community-based services and so on, so on, so forth. So, uh, well, thank you for uh, all the highlights. All of you have expertise in your own area uh, as, as it relates to elderly care. But uh, Matthew's book is very timely. Uh, uh, this is a call to action. I really hope uh, you know the entire NGO sector, you know, different organizations that work in elderly care in across the country, come together. Uh, to create something, a semblance of what is happening in the U.S., a complete in institutional structure that uh, advocates for the elderly and also to bring the issues to the government and, and make sure there are resources uh, for home and community-based services, not to mention the pension and, uh, and, and the serious, serious issue of elderly abuse and so on, so on, so forth. Once, once again, congratulations, Matthew, for uh, an excellent uh, book. I look forward to reading you and uh, reading this and also Congratulations to your family for helping you to put this together. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Dr. Muthuswami Kumaran. And excuse the proof errors once again. We'll, we'll clean up the copy next time when we print it and get the e-book out. Our next speaker also from the United States of America where uh, things are perhaps as bad as in India? No, no, maybe worse. We'd like to believe things are worse in there. Uh, I have Kavita Siva, Siva Ramakrishnan, and it's very, very important, uh, her intervention, I believe, because she's worked on social histories of epidemics and the role played by experts, scientific evidence, including the plague and its national and regional politics in South Asia. I think uh, uh, this issue has become all the more important in today's day and age, uh, because not only do we have a pandemic, we have an infodemic. Uh, Kavita Siva Ramakrishnan is a public health historian of South Asia. Uh, her main area of focus is the politics of health, medicine, and science in the global South. And her early research focused on indigenous, the politics of indigenous Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, and it's reconfiguring in a late colonial context in North India through claims and representations based on language and religion. Uh, it's all sounding very, very familiar today when we uh, have so much of uh, unscientific information doing the rounds. Uh, Kavita Ji is a uh, uh, and the faculty of Mailman School as an assistant professor of social medical sciences. She uh, was earlier a researcher at Harvard University.
uh, worked in a number of places, uh, University College London, was trained at Trinity College Cambridge and, the, and at our very own Jawaharlal Nehru University. So uh, you have an uh, uh, interdisciplinary perspective and uh, a perspective of a historian. Please, it's over to you now. Um, uh, thank you, Paranjoy, and uh, thank you to all the speakers for your patience in uh, having all of us here, and especially to Helpage and to um, uh, Matthew. So uh, first things first, to bring the focus back to, to him and the book. And I just want to say that I join everyone else in congratulating uh, Matthew. I've uh, known him, I've seen him as really a, a long time visionary, um, highly valued and respected colleague and a good friend really in the launch of this, uh, uh, at the occasion of the launch of this new book on aging and poverty uh, in India. I've thought of him as a thought leader really and an inspiration, especially in terms of um, whenever you meet Matthew, you realize, and I was looking at the panel today and I saw that um, in a way we all encapsulate uh, what are Matthew's fundamental strengths, which is that he really straddles this, he has a, he straddles this range of people who work with him and who he also works with, with a huge amount of generosity. And this, this ranges from um, a leadership of those who are practitioners, who are policymakers, activists, uh, journalists from civil society. And all of this really comes together because uh, Matthew has had the ability really um, to support and collaborate. He also listens. And what I found really amazing is that he realizes that in a marginalized and a kind of stigmatized field of aging where we all work, um, that we need to be fellow travelers. It's not possible to do this uh, by seeing oneself as an individual, uh, individ individualistic kind of campaigner or advocate, and that we need to work in collectivity. And I found this very, very helpful. Um, in, in all the efforts when I was researching aging uh, in India, there was no way in which I would have gone ahead without uh, Matthew's uh, support and intellectual generosity. So Matthew, at the outset, um, Absolutely, congratulations to your book and also very much to what you've raised in terms of the questions. I think there are a range of questions which can be raised with regard to aging in society. And you've looked at that which is really, I think, both at the moral and social heart of aging today in India, which is to ask questions about if older persons in terms of thinking about poverty. We all know that poverty has had a long history. I mean, Dada Bhai Naroji wrote about poverty. There's a range of development economists who've written about poverty. But the questions are really with regard to aging. What, how has poverty been recast and reinvented today in the context of globalization, which makes it so much more risky and precarious for those who are really vulnerable like older people? This is not the poverty of older people who live in simply in rural areas with families who plan who could be their caregivers. But in the context of acute urbanization and globalization, I think what we are thinking about is older people who are even more at risk, who cannot plan for their old age because they also see a younger generation. And I see old age as being very closely tied together to India's futures with regard to younger people who move away and migrate. There is a lack of planning of who could be giving care. And on the other hand, you've had a neoliberal state who has stepped back more and more from advancing any kinds of social protection except the most minimal. And I think what you really bring out in your book, which I think I found really fascinating in your overview, is the fact that we have had very lofty kind of ideals. You bring out the fact that we've had constitutional articles and recommendations for marginalized sections of our population. Populations. And uh, I like the way you really brought out that in the seventh decade of our nation, uh, chronologically, if it was the life course, it is the seventh decade, which is called young old age. We should be at a point of what in gerontology is called generativity. The notion of generativity, as you know, is the notion that people feel they want to leave a legacy for the next generation when you're in your 70s and 80s and you see the strong bond between young and old. So what you bring out really is now we are at a time nationally to be saying that we are not struggling like in the 1950s when in this Nehruvian vision of modernization, we could say that we are looking at a young and productive population because we need to catch up with the West and industrialize very quickly. So we put up these big industries, think of 
a pro project of industrialization, we have clearly reached a point now where we cannot deny the fact that we need to be a more welfare oriented state. And I really like the way the other speakers brought up the issue that you can begin to look at welfare, but do it like Nikhil and others said in a very, very tokenistic way. The fact that you do it, but you do it in such a kind of uh, mingy and inadequate way that it is nothing but something that is token. And um, this intersection of both economics, law, as well as seeking social justice, I think is the only way when we think of policy and advocacy to bring people uh, together. And both your career, as well as what you bring out in your book, um, really brings that out. In terms of COVID-19, I was thinking that what it has done is really fundamentally also to literally part the waters in terms of trying to stigmatize who is young and productive and who seems to count um, and who is old. And we term them as old also because they are chronologically old. You could have, um, while actually um, exposures to COVID or um, uh, vulnerability to COVID is not simply in terms of chronological age of 60 or 70. We all know that it is based on underlying morbidities and conditions. So one of the issues that is really, I think, crucial to us to discuss is who is old and what is this process of aging? Do we see that only as one phase of everyone being old past 60 or 65? Or do we also bring out those who are most fragile, who are 80 and above, the oldest of old, who are extremely vulnerable, and whom, if we had to set policy priorities, we should look at first. And if we had to think of those who are even in their 60s and 70s, we need to also think about social policy that needs to bring them back and not see them in the old framing of those who live and work and those who retire and don't contribute to society anymore, but also to how they can be regenerated and to contribute back to uh, society. I also like the way that in your book, you brought out the issue that it's not enough to bring in short-term fixes, that it's important, as you say, to look at a sustainable means to be able to address, it, address the needs of the most vulnerable and the old. And particularly the issues that you brought out and um, uh, uh, Moini Giriji brought out in terms of the feminization of aging and poverty. The fact that there is this dual vulnerability for older widows who neither have financial support and who are also stigmatized. And uh, the fact right. that... Yes, Sorry. Uh, Paranjoy, should I stop? No, okay. Right. So, and the fact that we um, increasingly the state is turning in its social policies in India to rely more and more on pushing the caregiving burden, especially the long term caregiving burden, which I really want to stress on families. The notion of invoking both in India and China ideas of filial piety and a Hindu past with Shravan Kumar and other things has been this notion that families should come back into the picture while the state can step in and do the minimal. But we know that unless families, and families have always been enterprising, unless they have the bare minimum and unless they are supported in policies, um, it, it is not enough. And you and I have had several discussions about the maintenance of parents, uh, uh, older adults act, and how much more we need to do in terms of looking at uh, support for older people. You also brought out, and I felt that was a very, very, interesting section of your book, the national policy for older persons. The fact that there is a need for much, much greater political will to do much more than what is needed, uh, especially for people who are older people who are below the poverty line. I also want to bring out the fact that what COVID has brought out, which is this urbanization and migration issue that older people are, the, are those especially who have had to, in rural villages, take up the burdens of both class, but also caste, especially for Dalit elders who work in, uh, who stay back in villages, whose, um, uh, when younger generations have moved off to the city, what is the exchange and support that they get when for those who are left behind? And I think the notion that you brought out of aging and especially rural poverty, that is a vulnerability in old age, which is at both threat to life as well as survival. And I think that kind of, uh, that exclusion and disempowerment really brings up the need for social protection as you bring it out. 
I uh, would like to stop here, but also point out that your book is very useful, not only in bringing out gaps, but also you bring out the socioeconomic caste index, the Alipi po poverty index, the fact that certain aging programs have worked very, very effectively in some states, and you would recommend that they be scaled up. So I'd like to end really by saying that um, crises like COVID really are tragedies, but as a historian, I see crises also as points of historical conjuncture. They are unique opportunities for us to kind of set things aside and think perhaps that we can look ahead. And also the fact that um, we need to think that one crisis does not stop because another starts. So just because we have COVID, we cannot ignore the fact that we have an ongoing crisis, that there may be some people who see epidemics. See, the interesting thing as a public health person I see is that epidemics can only be seen, especially in context when you have fairly good health. What is an epidemic and what is endemic? An epidemic is when you don't have a constant burden of infectious disease and you can see a higher rate of, um, of, of disease causation, right? But when you have a constant load of endemic chronic diseases with some populations, I would say we have an ongoing crisis that COVID is not the beginning and end for life to come back as normal because for many groups, life has never been normal. So what I want to really say is that we have an ongoing challenge that COVID brings up and highlights. It's a moment of a certain, they say epidemics are dramaturgic moments, moments of great drama, and a kind of reflection when people begin to see something starkly. And I think invisible populations become particularly visible at the time of an epidemic or pandemic. And that's what has happened. And I think your book is very, very uh, timely because this is the policy moment for the possibility for certain kinds of shifts. And I look to all the panelists uh, who are here who could make a difference to be able to think about that thinking that is this the time perhaps to put forward an issue otherwise that can get increasingly marginalized that we cannot only think about the productive population but we and we cannot think of older people as being a dependent population that we need to think beyond this dichotomy and uh, that is the point when we can actually ask uh, for the state uh, to step in i cannot resist but end uh, without acknowledging the talented aparajita your daughter who has very imaginatively made a very evocative cover of the Banyan uh, Tree of Life. Uh, I love the fact that it has long roots and networks and it serves really as a lesson that uh, we cannot make aging only a separate issue. When we make it a policy issue, we tie it very closely to the contribution of elders, the fact that they bring so much intergenerational solidarity and we have to therefore anchor it uh, in a local ecosystem. So congratulations to you, Matthew, your family. And it's a deep honor to be part of this panel, people whose work, um, I don't need, need to name all of you, uh, Dr. N.C. Saxena, Miss um, Mo um, uh, Mohini Giriji, and so many others whose work I've admired very, very deeply uh, through my own uh, uh, career. Uh, so thank you, and I thank look you. forward of your comments. Thank you, Kavita Ji. Thank you very much for your excellent uh, interventions and observations in the country where you come from. When I went there first time, I, I was uh, almost arrogant that in India, we didn't have the number of old people's homes that there were in the US, that the family, the family support systems were so important. But I guess that's no longer the case over the last several decades. And and uh, uh, Mr. Kiran Karnik has been very, very indulgent and he can't, uh, since he's the chairperson of Helpage India, and since he was supposed to be the first speaker, we have one more speaker, Mr. Kiran Karnik. So I'm going to ask Dr. A.B. Day. Right now, he he's a good Bengali like me. I asked him for his full name. He was a little reluctant, so he said, uh, "Doctor Oporajit." I guess I guess his middle name is Bhushan, but I may be wrong. But more importantly, Doctor Day is currently the professor and head of the Department of Geriatric Medicine in the at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I mean, he is uh, a, an expert in geriatric medicine. He's been. He's written for several international journals, and he has many, many affiliations, many administrative responsibilities. So he's going to bring into our discussion over here the, the perspective of a medical practitioner of repute and significance. Ever apni Dr. Apurajit De. Thanks. 
and i thank uh, matthew and everybody from helpage and to have me here uh, matthew is a good friend for all those years that he's in um, helpage uh, that the story that when he took over there are only two months of salary to be dispersed and when he leaves he has he's living in total uh, empire to the successor so all these years um, we have been supported by matthew in all our activities at aims um so i know you i grew up thinking that if you have got enough wealth if you have money in your bank probably you will live longer and there are enough research to suggest that the strongest determinant of health and well being and longevity is um, how much of money you have or socio economic status education blah 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 but when we started practicing uh, geriatric medicine it's about how many years 27 years now we found that people do live uh, go on living with their poverty to their ripe old age of 70s 80s maybe 90s we did some study in uh, delhi uh, a community based study funded by icmr in uh, 2006 7 or so and we looked at 80 plus population and we found that they are extremely poor so i always wondered how can they be poor and still living so probably that is the strength of um, biology that they have lived on they have crossed the age of heart attack cancer etc so next uh, rest part uh, god will take care this covid crisis we are time and again coming over to covid crisis has made me feel that we are an extremely selfish people in the name of um, protecting ourselves with uh, social we should have been physical distancing we made it social distancing and locking down ourselves inside house we forgot that there is a group of people about 95% of them have some chronic disease or the other that they are my clients and they come to government facilities government services under uh, health national program for health care of the elderly to collect their free medicines for diabetes heart disease hypertension etc etc so i always every day morning i feel last 3 months about 80 to 90% of my clients have not renewed their prescription to get it uh, get free supply of medicines from our own dispensary um, supplied by aims institute uh, organization or from the cghs or other um, such agencies which provide free medicines to their uh, ex employees so we have forgotten that uh, dying from heart attack is also important or diabetes not getting controlled is also important or a cancer patient who was uh, treatable in the beginning has become untreatable now and the cost of this treatment are so high after all there is an issue of access even if somebody gets an access to a private health care it's just unaffordable so when i discuss this in our faculty meeting they say though they can buy the medicine i told how they can buy one of our ongoing research study throughout the country so that 50% of the respondents in a telephonic interview have lost income and about a third of them have eaten less in the previous week is the fear that they may not have enough food in their house in the next two so when they have money they will probably buy food rather than medicines for the parents i, I don't think anything it's not a moral issue it's just a question of hunger over medicine for the aged parents who anyway can are managing without them so obviously um, it's a very difficult and immoral scenario where we are kind of using our resources and all our energy in making score every day that it is 3 lakh 33000 and there's 9000 sixers and things like that whereas large majority are are not having even the minimum of treatment there should be or the health care they should be having so there is a discussion our residents uh, thought of that all these years that we have learned everything is of no value i mean after all chronic disease care or caring for the older people of no value in the system i mean after all 
to speak in hindi as jukham or a my cold which is a bit tricky that has taken over the whole society in that scenario the issue of poverty has become very important now um in last uh, younger generation cannot understand what poverty is since 1991 things have improved people have got enough money so they were worried that if you open up the hospital there will be 10000 patients as usual every day i don't know that's not going to happen they will have enough money in the pocket to eat first and then take their elderly parent to hospital for treatment and that's the way life works so this uh, discussion has become more relevant that um, money matters poverty is a curse and when matthew cherian wrote this book i thought i'll i always knew that i'm mean, older people are poor they live in poverty they have got they are in a state of sort of destitution and you give a, a little bit of dhakka and then uh, they are out of the system so thanks matthew for uh, putting things in perspective that uh, uh, private hospitals um, that uh, public private mode blah blah etc they are all nice to talk to but in crisis like this they are all exposed that the weakness in the society is thoroughly exposed that the standard treatment for a painful knee it requires a bit of a physiotherapy nothing done for last three months and we provide all sorts of care so obviously we understand and we have developed a telemedicine setup in our institution so everybody asks so when are you going to open when i will get my supply of medicine so what i say i mean you said that okay you buy it we know they can't buy it there's no money in the pocket to buy it so thanks matthew for putting the focus back on aging and poverty and we look forward to many more uh, many such uh, um, revelations in future by you and helpage india and tell the society that uh, there are people who are not visible as it was as kavita told things become visible now now they have become visible that poverty really matters and hunger and not getting the minimum necessities of life has now become very obvious thank you thank you very much thank you very much dr bay for your remarks i couldn't agree with you more that what we've seen over the last few months is not i mean at one level we talk about the poverty of resources the poverty i mean the absence of money but for the elderly more than ever before perhaps it's a poverty of companionship poverty of dignity that is also making such a huge difference as has already been mentioned by some of the panelists and and i think in more ways than one i uh, i think all of you will uh, have no reason to disagree with me what we've seen in the last few months and certainly in indian society and perhaps in many societies across the planet at one level we seeing people coming out and helping the underprivileged but we've also had it's seen the worst we've seen stories of horror you know i i i remember uh, from my youth uh, i heard stories from my parents who are no more about the great bengal famine uh, the second world war the partition of india in certain ways i feel that we've regressed 75 or 80 years in time we've seen some terrible things happening i never thought i'd see these in my lifetime be that as it may that's enough for me i'm supposed to be only a moderator here but the chairperson of helpage india who's actually supposed to kick off today's proceedings is the last speaker and uh, i've known him for some years and i per, I, i think he's uh, describes though himself as a public unintellectual intellectual has become a bit of a dirty word buddhi jeevi koi baat nahi sir you are not a buddhi jeevi but you have you call yourself a non academic you have very strong interests in public policy in strategy you worked in the information technology sector you headed the nascom the national association for software and service companies between 2001 and 2008 uh you've done a lot to put uh, a delinquent firm like satyam computers back on track as the head of its government uh, appointed committee which is one of the biggest frauds of its kind you worked with the government you've been a part of the scientific advisory council to the prime minister the national advisory council 
you've been a part of the media, you've been part of Discovery Communications, Animal Planet, you launched it in India. You've been in, uh, associated with the first uh, uh, major television venture when you were part of the Indian Space Research Organization site, the sat Satellite Instructional Television Experiment, uh, the India and the US project. And you are now associated with a number of not-for-profit organizations, the honorary president of the India Habitat Center. You've been a director on the board of the Reserve Bank of India. I could go on and on and on and on. You've authored books. Uh, your latest book, I think, is called uh, Crooked Minds. It's about innovation. You contribute regularly. You've uh, also written a book called The Coalition of, Com uh, uh, Coalition of Competitors. You are a been awarded the Padma Shri. So thank you so much, Kiran Karnik ji, for not just being the chairperson of Health Age India, but being the public unintellectual that you are. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Paranjoy. And uh, once again, I'm, I'm sorry for not joining at the start, as indicated earlier. Uh, sorry to all of you, but sorry particularly for myself, because hearing the last few speakers, I feel terrible that I've missed out on the earlier ones. This has been tremendously insightful and yet so brief. I don't think I can match the brevity and wisdom, but let me at least try to match the first to be brief. So let me make a few points briefly. Uh, first, congratulations to Matthew. It's a delight that Matthew heads Helpage India. I've had the good fortune and pleasure for knowing him for many, many years, but in my capacity as chairman Helpage, Unfortunately, a brief association only so far for just under two years. Uh, but Matthew, congratulations on your book. Uh, I have only one complaint, a serious complaint. You promised to send me a PDF version, which I didn't get. So unlike some of the other speakers, and I could see that Kavita in particular has already been through it thoroughly, uh, I, I've missed out on that. But I will hold you to ransom for that separately, and I'll read the book and come back to you for a long discussion one-on-one -on -one separately. But congratulations to you and indeed to your whole family for supporting you through this and your, for your daughter for the illustration of the cover, which I heard from, from uh, Kavita. Uh, just a few points, and I want to pick up from what some of the speakers have said. Uh, first, I was delighted to hear Dr. Day speak about physical distancing because social distancing is something which we in India have practiced for centuries. And that's terrible, the kind of social distancing and what it means here. We just picked up this word from the West and they started using it, so did we as many other things which we unthinkingly copy. Though, of course, we have a 5,000 year civilizational history, which everybody refers to. But that apart, I wish we had started with physical distancing from the beginning. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about the elders and aging and just express one or two points of particular concern. Uh, we've heard a lot of the speakers talk of the neglect of the elders. I think it's been terrible. What's given by way of pension is really hardly a pension. It's like giving arms to somebody. It's, it's what you know is given to somebody who, who's standing outside and you some people you give them some money. I mean, it's that kind of thing that's going on, the kind of money that's given. It's ridiculous. Uh, it's not even near the minimum wage prescribed in any state. It's nowhere near the NREGA payments. And I think this is ridiculous. I know Matthew and some of you, in fact, many of you, have been helping to fight this battle. We will continue to fight it and bring the advocacy and the power of the elders hopefully mobilized in some way to make sure that they begin to get reasonable pensions and attention in this country as they deserve. It's not something which we should have to plead for. It is an entitlement. It's a right. And I think it has to be somehow fought and got. But like many other rights, as I said, it has to be fought and got. I don't think we're going to get it easily. I heard what Mr. Ashwini Kumar said, and he's right. The government is, you know, got a, lots of things to do. Uh, they're not all of one mind. There are people who there who are very good, but they operate in their own way. And they're not likely to move on this by some altruism. They will have to be pushed into it. And that's an attempt which I know Matthew and the team have been doing with support from many of you from the outside. Let's continue on that effort. The one thing that I want to speak of, which was alluded to by some of you, but I want to spend a few moments on that today, is the kind of discrimination that we see against the elders in terms of not what may happen in the family, which is terrible. And I know there were some earlier discussions on it. And we've been working hard at seeing how to prevent that kind of domestic violence. It's not just gender-based, it's also age-based. And if you have gender and age, then it's even more terrible. But I want to speak about discrimination at the sort of official authority level. And I see this time and again in all kinds of ways. Uh, one uh, visible 
and you know almost you might say covert way of doing it is to talk of the demographic dividend the young and what they do and that's indeed a great thing i am one of those who's been very supportive and strong and saying look the young bring fresh ideas they are fearless they are risk taking they innovate so let's see how we can support them but it cannot be that this is only the young we worry about i think we have a big resource in this country also in terms of elders both to tap into as a resource but also a responsibility to look after them and provide them the policy framework that's required instead what we seem to have is a policy framework and regulations that discriminate against the elders if i look particularly now at the time of covid and you know i'm glad dr day is here and he it might hopefully contradict me because i'd like to be proved wrong on this but i see all these figures and yes the aged are definitely vulnerable but the fact is that all the figures that at least i have seen i'm not an expert on this at all talks of the fatality rate the elders in this country have high fatality rates anyway because as dr day said there were a lot of other ailments which very often they can't get medicine or treatment for because they can't afford it because our public health system is broken so they do die in high numbers and i have not seen a good comparison yet of the normal fatality or morbidity rate amongst elders versus the covid rate and i'd like to see that rather than saying they are vulnerable and therefore they need to be locked in their houses i mean one of the things as we all know is that many many of the elders for their social good but also for their physical health need to get out and walk in fresh air and exercise if you are diabetic overweight the prescription is not just medicines and diet it's also exercise and you say don't get out of your house and the warnings are not just for younger people it is specially for elder people it's couched under the word guidelines but in many many places including a number of the societies or colonies in our cities have brought in their own super regulation which says elders cannot go out and walk they must stay in their house you know this seems to me a sort of active form of discrimination which is there even when air travel has been started recently one of the guidelines says it's a guideline again please note the word those over 65 you know should avoid traveling and they are the ones who are often stranded because this lockdown came with four hours notice as we all know they are somewhere their caregivers the normal caregivers are somewhere else they need to get back to home need to get back to something and your first advice is guideline is people over 65 should avoid travel i mean are they endangering others are they more prone to this then that's a problem yes it is possible that they are more prone and a little more fatalities may arise though i have not seen evidence yet saying they are more prone but are they also more spreaders i have seen no evidence to say they spread more than others in which case why are they being discriminated in this very active way this is just one part of what we are seeing with covid itself beyond that we begin to see the kind of discrimination and the policy framework now many people and again matthew led this effort have done this to try and create geriatric wards in district hospitals look at the figures how many of them actually have put that into place they just not there how many geriatric specialists are there like dr day just inadequate number and our number of elders is increasing rapidly what are we doing for them the public health system on which they depend so much is completely as i said broke and of course nobody dares to raise the fact that very high dignitaries say they'll build a grand monument a temple in 6 months or 8 months or 1 year and nobody talks of setting up a hospital in 6 months the lockdown was supposed to give us a time to build public facilities how many hospitals have been created how many hospitals have been started and i when i look at other countries and see what they have done let me not name them because they are a, in quotes enemy country one city there has tested 6 million people in 10 days i'm going by media reports they did group testing they did it somehow and in delhi we are yet not even touching a figure of 10000 tests a day and we are praying no no we have touched 10000 what is the problem if testing is required why can't we learn and do it and if elders are particularly vulnerable if the elders need to be taken care of what are we doing to test them how can they be tested how do we look at what we need to do how do we get the public health system going again and set up hospitals which are badly required with geriatric wards and enough beds for those who presumably are more vulnerable i think these are issues about which i'm greatly agitated on behalf of the elders yes i have a vested interest because i'm an elder as most of you on this panel are but i think this problem is more seriously serious with the numbers that we have and what we need to take care of 
it is something that we need to look at very, very carefully. There is a lot of argument for community care. It's a good argument. It's something which should be done. But again, it needs to be supported. It needs to be backed up with something solid. And that backup has to come from the public health system. The government cannot abdicate its responsibility and say the elders will be looked after by the family. As more than one speaker has pointed out, the family, the caregivers, the earner is often not there. In many, many villages, the younger adults have all gone because there are no jobs there. There are only a few children and their mothers who look after them and then the elders. And this is the situation where in which we really need something to be done by way of social security support for them. And this is the time again when the government is privatizing and saying, hey, go and get insurance and go to a hospital. I mean, I can't see anything worse than this. Despite all the COVID things, you've seen a huge economic revival package that talked, had a few sentences, literally a few sentences about public health. The rest of it was all about nice things to do and, and self-reliance. As somebody told me, the self-reliance slogan means, hey, just depend on yourself or depend on God. That's it. Don't, don't look at the government. It's not their responsibility. And we're not talking of a government which is feudal and the so-called Mahabab Sarkar. No, this is our right in a democracy. And this has to be part of the rights framework to be able to get these services, to be able to have public health, like there is needs to be public education, which has to be there provided for anybody who needs it. This is just not happening. And I think this is going to be the big battle. Matthew's book, I'm sure, is going to contribute a lot to this debate. I'm hoping that will also contribute to a lot of the, to the advocacy as we push this forward. I'm glad we are building coalitions. I can see the power of this increasing. I'm not pessimistic at all, though I, you know, you might see a little ire and anger in as I speak, but I'm very optimistic about where we are because we've built a lot of coalitions now. I think we are reaching the cusp of where we will be able to seriously take that advocacy and create substantial changes, at least at state level, if not the central level, and begin to make changes, maybe slowly and incrementally, but begin to make meaningful changes in how the elders are treated, looked after and cared for, both in terms of dignity and in terms of physical and psychological needs. Thank you very much, Paranjo. I want to stop there. And once again, thank you. apologies for not being on. Thank time. you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Kiran Karnikji, for those uh, comments and those observations. I, I think uh, in more ways than one, uh, we are going through terrible times. And and it seems to me that many of those who are in positions of power and authority do not seem to realize, even in this kind of terrible times that we're living in, that the criminal neglect of the public health care system in this country. I mean, this has been one of the uh, biggest failures of India as a nation state in, in the last 70 years. Uh, and, and as... as uh, uh, many have commented. I mean, the, the, the private healthcare system and the way it's trying to fleece and uh, uh, fleece people and continues to fleece people, the for-profit organization, and we'll see what's happening in, in India's national capital, the city where many of us here are. When you see what's happening in, in, in major urban agglomerations like Mumbai, like Ahmedabad, like Kolkata, like Chennai, I, I think the limitations of where we are have come out absolutely so starkly and so nakedly that, uh, well, I actually want to say this, that I do feel ashamed as an Indian citizen that have allowed this kind of criminal neglect not only of our public health care system, but of our elderly. So I, I think uh, every speaker has spoken. And what is even better than other than uh, Mr. Ashwini Kumar, everybody is still here with us. All There, there are uh, all of us, eight of us here still at this particular juncture. Yes, uh, I, I think, yes, there are a couple of people who may, may have sort of uh, dropped out. But may I now uh, sort of ask if any of you, here, want to make any observations, any comments, uh, it could be directed either directly at Matthew Cherian or Dr. Saxena, or for that matter, anybody, anybody in this group, they should feel free to say so before I ask Matthew to uh, kind of uh, propose a vote of thanks of sorts and, and then sort of conclude our, our deliberations. But before that, we still have a little bit of time, and therefore, if anyone here you just have to 
raise your hand or just sort of wave out like this and the administrator will unmute you and you can speak. Sab log chup ho gaye kya hua? Everybody is a little quiet. Kya kotha bolte chahiye na doctor de? What to do? I know only three languages. I'm speaking in all three of them. But anyway, uh, Miss Kavita wants to say something. Please go ahead, Kavita. I quickly wanted to reflect on uh, what Mr. Kiran Karnik was saying, and I think that underlies what uh, a lot of others were saying about uh, the notion of Atma Nirbhata during COVID, which is very much uh, this idea back to individual responsibility, which has been a push in public health, I would say, for the last many decades. Uh, the notion that you hold individuals responsible for their ill health. Um, if you're in poverty and sick, that poverty is your responsibility and not structural. Um, so there is constantly now the play of this which comes up, which is very dangerous, I think, because uh, it takes away from what the state uh, should be able to do when it's withdrawing, as we know, from the public sector altogether. It has subsidized the private sector, which is not being held accountable. So the state has stepped back and lacks any, uh, lacks or at least lacks any kind of monitoring and evaluation powers uh, to be able to hold others responsible, uh, even if it has outsourced uh, some of this. So I thought some of these comments are really apt, including what Dr. Day was saying uh, about the state of uh, hospitals. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. Nikhil, you want to say something? Please, go yeah, ahead. I, yeah, I want to say that can we, at the end of today, in terms of being able to do something in terms of advocacy for people, um, from the Pension Parishad, if there had not been all the various restrictions on democracy that the lockdown has brought with it, some out of a fear psychosis, some out of um, the legal framework that, is, that has been drawn up, we would have been on the streets because actually, just to give you an example in Rajasthan, because the state government has expanded the coverage of, of pensioners, it moved from 14 lakhs when it was only dependent on the central government pensioners, social security pensioners, to 80 lakhs today. But there are about 14 lakhs, 15 lakhs who are getting no food security. They are not under the National Food Security Act. So can we not tell the central government that you please kindly cover all the elderly, at least in terms of PDS coverage, if they, since they are not doing universal coverage all the way across, at least for the elderly. And again, they have only given a little bit of extra money to, again, their same 18, 19, 20% of the elderly. The rest of the elderly are, as Dr. Day said, and so many others said, actually living a life of destitution. And at this time, we have a myth that they are being protected by their families because their families are also in a state of destitution. And we have seen so many who are leading a tortuous life. So I think at least this is something if we, through this panel, if we can ask for a couple of things that are extremely important and try and push it because where does one get the platform? How does one raise the voice for what are today 120 million people, out of whom at least 90 or 100 million people will require support? And you cannot have the state stepping asking for a dole. There are people who have worked all their lives, like the rest of the unorganized sector who we've just noticed. And now in their old age, they have none. OK. Thank you, thank you, Nikhil, for your intervention. Would anybody here like to comment or make any observation on what Avita Chivaramakrishnan and Nikhil they have said? The abdication of the, of the state when you, in the name of Atmanirvarta or self reliance, you sort of leave people uh, to their, I mean, I, mean, I mean, completely people who are helpless, you ask them, you know do your best under the circumstances. And we see uh, uh, the kind of manner in which the public healthcare system has, even today, apparently not seeing uh, the kind of attention that we should at this juncture. And, and, and uh, to make things worse, I must say, the horror stories that one hears of people profiteering, or of people 
profiteering from the misery of others, whether it be the fake so-called ventilator scam in Ahmedabad to the manner in which personal protection equipment has been overpriced. I mean, we, we sort of uh, hardly a day, go, day goes by when we do not learn about a horror story. So I actually have, uh, I mean, the floor is open. Anybody wants to comment, feel free to do so. And if nobody wants to say anything, Matthew Cherian will take over. Matthew, nobody's saying anything. Uh, Dr. Saxena, would you like to say something? Uh, about the overall expenditure on health, uh, let me say a few things. First of all, as you all know, <laughs> India spends just about 1.2% 1, 1. of its GDP on, on health. The international norm is at least 3%. Uh, the Congress government had uh, announced that they would increase it to 2 to 3 percent. It was in the budget. It was said in the uh, president's speech also. Unfortunately, it never happened. And the expenditure still remains 1.2 percent. The other point here is that today, of course, in this point of crisis, we are thinking of hospitals. We are thinking of tertiary health service. <clears throat> but in fact, in India, it is not only the tertiary health service, but also the preventive health service or the primary health service, which is very, very weak, which is the weakest. So we need to strengthen at all the three levels, primary health service, secondary health service, and the, and the tertiary health service. All, all these need to uh, be uh, strengthened. So therefore, that is a point that we need to uh, keep, uh, keep in mind. And the other point is that if you look at the structure of government, our, uh, in our government, there are too many babus, orderlies, uh, clerks, drivers who are not needed. And there's shortage of teachers, doctors, and nurses. So the structure of government service in India also needs a big change. Unfortunately, uh, if you want more doctors and more nurses, you have to train them. But if you want to have more drivers and more, more chaprasis, you don't have to. You can just appoint them on the basis of uh, some, some MLA's recommendation. So therefore, the number of unwanted government servants keeps on increasing, whereas the number of people who can really provide service, whether they are doctors, nurses, teachers, even policemen, they are in short supply. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Saxena for your comments. And, and I can see them other than uh, Ashwini Kumarji, uh, everybody is still with us at this particular point of time. So uh, it, it's been almost two hours, I, I think a minute or two short of two hours that we've been uh, sitting here and, and, and in different parts of the world and different parts of the country and deliberating on uh, issues that are of considerable, of, of great importance to certainly the elderly and, and I think not just the elderly as, as has been pointed out, in a sense, the future of the entire country and the youth too are dependent greatly on how we as a country, we as a society, we as a multicultural society treat the elderly. So uh, it's been my honor and my privilege uh, to be the moderator of this conversation and this discussion. And I'm sure it will be, uh, it has been recorded and I'm sure it will be made available to everybody concerned here. Uh, so let me thank Dr. Uh, Ashwini Kumar in absentia, Nikhil De, Dr. Muthuswami Kumaran, Ms. Kavita Sivaramakrishnan, Dr. A.B. De, uh, uh, um, Mrs. Mohini Giri, of course, Mr. Kiran Karnik, Dr. N.D. Saxena. And over to you now. Matthew Cherian. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paranjoy. Uh, I would like to add uh, one more fact to this picture that we still spend only 0.08% of our GDP on the elderly. So that is much, much less than 1%. And uh, in the last that I drew up about the number of geriatric beds in the country. It is 4,468 beds are only available, geriatric beds are available in rural India. So that means theoretically only 4,448 
68 people can fall sick, either due to COVID or to comorbidities or whatever be the reason. So this is the great shortage which is available. And as a result of it, we are staring at a situation where health crisis is going to loom ahead of us. And the second fact is, uh, still date, 8% of the deaths have been 60 plus. And uh, of course, my friend and colleague, Dr. Day, can add a little bit more to this. And what is needed is something drastic, which is to be done now. And apart from pension and apart from ration and uh, food to be distributed to the elderly, we need to seriously look at healthcare in the coming few days. So I would like to thank all the panelists and uh, Dr. N.C. Saxena, Team Health Page. And also I'd like to point a correction that it is my younger daughter, Arundhati Matthew, who did the design. <laughs> and my elder daughter did the editing of the document, which is more painstaking than the design. And uh, so I would like to thank both my daughters. And uh, there are two people, uh, not two people, three people actually, uh, which is uh, Anupama and uh, Dr. Rohit Kumar, who did the referencing work for this document, because there were a lot of references which was needed, which is, uh, which is also another painstaking job, which was done. And, uh, Last but not least is uh, Rajeshwar Devarkonda. He is, of course, uh, the creative person who brought about livelihoods work for the elderly, which is uh, which has been a great innovation that we have brought about. In a country where pensions are failing, they have to work till they die. So we have... Uh, brought in these livelihoods for the elderly, which government of India has taken it up, but I hope they expand it across the country. So that future Indians who grow old will have at least some pension and some livelihoods in their old age. If they do not do this, I still maintain that this will not be a country for old people. So most of you will grow old, but will die in poverty. So that's the conclusion of the book, which is on aging and poverty. Thank you all for your attention and thank you for being such good hosts. And uh, last but one to the publisher, both Paranjoy and Manish Purohit, I have I thanked them for bringing all the document in time, even uh, with all the COVID issues which were looming large. And, Thank you. Thank you all, everybody. I congratulate everybody. Congratulate Matthew. Thank you very much. And have a good day. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. We may conclude the proceedings here. And thank you. And actually, Paranjoy had brought some books, which I hear.